What is the 483 years prophecy? Why should you care about it? And what does it have to do with your life? Hey guys, Britt here. Welcome to End Times Bible Prophecy. Earlier in the week, we had a video titled, Are We Living in the End Times? And in that video, we referenced a period called Daniel's 70th week, a future seven-year period known as the Tribulation. Well, that begs the question, if Daniel has a 70th week, what happened to the previous 69 weeks, or what happened to those previous 69 sets of seven-year periods, which would equate to 483 years? Well, there's actually a prophecy regarding those 483 years, and I believe it's one of the most astounding prophecies in the Bible. So let's look into it. First, I want to I want to look at an excerpt from this book. This is called Coming to Jesus. I wrote this book, not pushing to sell this book. It's free on Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, uh, Apple iBooks, Google Play, Kobo, pretty much anywhere that ebooks are available, you can download this book for free. If you do not know Jesus, I believe this book can transform your life and change it forever. And if you already know Jesus, I believe that this book will strengthen your faith like nothing else has before. So guys, so we're going to look at an excerpt from this. This is from Coming to Jesus. It's titled Daniel's 483 Years. While still captive in Babylon, the prophet Daniel was visited by the angel Gabriel. During this visitation, Gabriel revealed that precisely 483 years would pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one comes. That's from Daniel 9.25. We're going to go look at that real quick. It says, now listen and understand seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, comes. Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and strong defenses despite the perilous times. So here we have 69 sets of seven-year periods. That's 483 years. So this is saying for, from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem, 483 years will pass, and then the Messiah will come. So let's read on. It says, so what does this mean? Well, it means exactly what it said. It meant the Messiah, the anointed one, would appear exactly, that's, that's key here, precisely 483 years after the command to rebuild Jerusalem. So did this happen? To find out, we only need to count forward 483 years from the time of the command to rebuild Jerusalem. In the year 457 BC, the king of Persia, Artaxerxes, issued a decree instructing officials in the province west of the Euphrates to give Ezra, quote, whatever he requests of you, in his efforts to rebuild Jerusalem, reinstitute the temple services, appoint judges and magistrates, and teach the law. This is the starting point for the 483-year countdown. If you count forward 483 years from 457 BC, you get the year AD 27. Note that the year zero doesn't count. This is the time when Israel should have been looking for the arrival of the Messiah. And as we noted earlier, which is what it does in the book, the chief priests and Jewish leaders of this era were looking for the Messiah. So if you go and you, you uh, read the book of John, You'll see John the Baptist preaching and the religious teachers, the, the leaders of the law, they come to him and they say, are you the Messiah? And he says, no, I'm not. And then they ask, well, are you Elijah? What, you know, why were they asking these questions? Well, the word of God, the scripture said that, that Elijah the prophet would come before the Messiah. That's a, and then we also read that... Uh, the Messiah would come at the specific time period. So they were expecting the arrival of the Messiah. That's why they questioned John the Baptist the way they did. The year AD 27 coincides with the beginning of the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth, since it's generally accepted that his ministry lasted three to three and a half years, and he was crucified in spring of the year AD 31. The book of Daniel also predicts that after the 483 years pass and the Messiah comes, he will be killed 
appearing to have accomplished nothing. Then a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the temple and the city. So did this happen? Yes, Jesus was killed and his ministry appeared to have fallen short of its goals. Why? Because at the time of his arrival, the Israelites were looking for a Messiah who would conquer their Roman oppressors and rule the earth in righteousness forever. They were expecting fulfillment of the prophecies of the Messiah's second coming, not realizing at the time that the Messiah would come twice, once as a suffering Messiah and the second time as a conquering Messiah. So the death of Jesus on the cross seemed to indicate, at least in the world's eyes, that he was not the Messiah, that he had, quote, accomplished nothing. Less than four decades after the crucifixion in the year A.D. 70, the Roman legions under the command of Titus destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. To this day, the Arch of Titus stands in Rome as a monument to this event. So was Titus a ruler whose armies will destroy the temple and the city? Yes. While Titus was at the time commander of the military campaign to put down the Jewish rebellion, he was also the son of the Emperor Vespasian, and Titus himself served as emperor following his father's death, making him a ruler in every sense of the word. The book of Daniel clearly stated the Messiah would come in the year AD 27, and the temple would be destroyed shortly thereafter, which it was in the year 7 AD 70. So in order to fulfill the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament, any messianic candidate would have had to have lived between the years 27 and 70 AD. Jesus of Nazareth is the only historical figure from this period or any period to fulfill the messianic prophecies. So think about the, the miraculous, this miraculous sign, the Basically, the birth of Jesus, the time of his birth, was foretold hundreds of years in advance because the Messiah had to appear in the time period that he appeared at. This isn't something that could be prearranged. It could only come from God. This is just one more sign that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, our Savior, as the Bible says. And so we look, it's one of many messianic prophecies. If we go and we look in uh, another chapter, we go through these messianic prophecies and list dozens and dozens of them. I'm just going to look at a few here to give you an idea of how precise these prophecies are and how only one man in all of history fulfilled these prophecies, and that was Jesus of Nazareth. This says he would be betrayed by a friend. Over 3,000 years ago, King David promised the Messiah would be betrayed by a trusted best friend, a person so close they shared each other's food. That's from Psalm 41.9. Did this happen to Jesus? Yes, a thousand years later, David's prophecy was fulfilled when Jesus predicted his betrayal at the Last Supper. He told the disciples he would dip his bread in a bowl and hand it to the one who would betray him. He did so and handed the bread to Judas. Judas then left the room and went off to betray Jesus. And he betrayed him for a certain price. It says 500 years before it happened, the prophet Zechariah foretold the exact price for which the Messiah would be betrayed, 30 pieces of silver. Go look it up in Zechariah 11 verse 12. After Jesus dipped his bread in the bowl and handed it to Judas, Judas went to the Jewish priests and elders and betrayed Jesus for the exact sum of 30 pieces of silver. 500 years before Judas betrayed Jesus, God told the prophet Zechariah that the 30 pieces of silver, the great sum at which he was valued, would be thrown in the potter's field. So what is the potter's field? In ancient times, the potter's field was the place of burial for unknown or indigent, indigent people. Clay was extracted from the fields for the production of pottery, but the leftover field was only useful as a burial ground. When Judas betrayed Jesus to the Jewish priests and elders, they paid him 30 pieces of silver. But when he realized what he had done, Judas returned and tried to get the money back. When they wouldn't take it, he threw the money down in the temple. Thinking it was not right to put blood money in the temple treasury, the leading priest used the money to buy a potter's field for the burial of foreigners. So think about all of these prophecies. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of messianic prophecies describing the first coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. 
And those were fulfilled precisely and exactly as the Bible said they would be fulfilled. And only one man fulfilled those, Jesus of Nazareth. So let's go and see. We'll read this other section. It says, the fact of the matter is it's highly unlikely anyone would fulfill these prophecies. I mean, they're so detailed. Yet Jesus did. How unlikely? Let's say you had a 50-50 chance of fulfilling each of the prophecies just noted. Your odds of success are 2 to the 37th power, or 1 and 137 billion, 438 million, 953,472. So with just a 1 in 2 chance of fulfilling each prophecy, and that's only the ones that we covered, there's more, only one out of every 137 billion people would be successful. Now think about that. There's, what, 8 billion people on the earth right now? And back when Jesus walked on the earth during the first coming, we're talking maybe 50 million people is the estimate around that time. So 1 in 137 billion people. And that's assuming your odds are 50-50. Do you really think the average person has a 50-50 chance of being born in Bethlehem? of being buried in a rich man's tomb, or entering a temple that was destroyed almost 2,000 years ago. And we can add to that the 483 years prophecy. Does everyone have a 50-50 chance of being born so that they are around between the years 27 and 70, which is when the Bible says the Messiah had to appear? That was a time period that he had to appear. Because he had to enter the temple, and the temple was destroyed in the year 70. And the 483 years prophecy from Daniel tells us that's when the Messiah would appear, and that is when Jesus of Nazareth appeared. So why am I telling you all of this? Well, one of the reasons that I'm telling you this is because you can take heart, you can take faith and joy and comfort in knowing that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. He is God's anointed one. He is our Savior. He is everything the Bible says about him because the, all of these prophecies that God outlined in the Bible, they were all fulfilled in one person, Jesus of Nazareth. We can trust in him. We can put our hope and faith in him. And knowing that all of those prophecies were fulfilled exactly to the letter, we can know that the prophecies of his second coming will also be fulfilled precisely and exactly as outlined in the Bible. And Jesus is coming again. Jesus and the prophets, the Bible and the Word of God, they tell us that w there are certain signs to look for, and Jesus commanded us to watch for those signs. And we see those signs today. Jesus said when you see all those signs converge, you can know he is coming soon. He is right at the door. And we see those signs today. The people of Israel are back in the land of Israel. The land of Israel is, once again, for 19 centuries, Christians couldn't point to that sign. It just did not exist. The Jewish people are back in control of the city of Jerusalem. Again, that's something 95% of all the Christians who have ever lived could never say that. The gospel is being preached all over the world. The Gog of Magog Alliance is coming together. We see calls for global government. We see all these different signs. We see the mark of the beast system being put in place. Jesus when, said, when you see all of these things happening, when you hear these wars and rumors of wars and famines and pestilence, we've certainly seen pestilence in the last few years. When you see these signs converging together, you know that it's time to look up. Your salvation draws near is what Jesus tells us. So, guys, we live in the season of the Lord's return, and we can take comfort that Jesus is our Messiah. He is our Savior. He is the one that we should be looking to in these times. While the world around us seems to be falling apart, everything in God's Word is falling into place, and we can place our trust and our hope in Jesus, and we can comfort one another with those words, and we can get joy from that. So guys, I hope you like this video. Leave your comments below. Make sure to like and share this. And God willing, we'll talk tomorrow.
If you want to learn more about the end times and Bible prophecy, make sure to sign up for my free monthly newsletter and get your copy of my free ebook, Seven Signs of the End Times. Just follow the link in the description to get your free book. Also, make sure to check out all of my books. Just look up Brit Gillette on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Apple iBooks, Google Books, Kobo, or anywhere books are sold. Thanks for watching today, and until next time, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith.